Okay, Alexander, let's talk about uh, Nord Stream 2. And uh, you've got a video on this on your channel. So this will, we'll talk about uh, this topic and uh, we'll have a lot of good reference points for people to, to dig into what has just happened. And I'll just try to sum it up because I'm, I'm kind of a little stunned, a little shocked at uh, what has gone on and jump in when I'm done. <laughs> so Germany and the United States have come to an agreement to let Nord Stream 2 proceed. So Germany has gotten the okay from the U.S. to allow natural gas to run through Germany. Germany's gotten the okay from the U.S. to proceed. And in order to get that okay from the United States, Germany has to give money to Ukraine. On the flip side, Germany is also telling Russia, in order to make this deal go through, you also have to give money to Ukraine in the form of transit fees, not until 2025, I believe, is the agreement, but up until 2032 or 34 or whatever, 10, 10 more years. It's not that much money going to Ukraine, you'll get the details, but in essence, <laughs> that is the deal. I, I'm still a little stunned because Germany goes to the U.S. to get approval, for which the U.S. tells Germany, in order to get approval, you have to give money to Ukraine, and it's all under this green energy scheme, which to me just smells like corruption. Corruption, corruption, corruption. Money to Ukraine, green energy, I smell corruption. Anyway, Alexander, what? Uh, I, I'm, I'm stunned at, at, at this, I really am. No, you're absolutely right to be stunned. I mean, the whole thing is absolutely ridiculous. And by the way, on the corruption, you're absolutely right. Let's 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 start with the point. Firstly, this is all about protecting Ukraine. This is supposedly all about protecting Ukraine. Why does Ukraine have a right to be a transit state? Nobody's ever been able to explain this to me. What rights does any country have to engage in any part of the international trading system in one form or another. If Germany and Russia want to trade directly with each other, why are they obliged to go through Ukraine? I mean, this whole argument is a bogus one from the start. That's the first thing to say. But anyway, what we now have is this. The U Europeans, or to be precise, the Germans, have said that, yes, we've now got the U.S.'s position to build a pipeline, which is now 98% complete, and which will be in operation this year, and which we spent a lot of money on, and which the Russians have spent an awful lot of money on. So we've now got permission to build and operate this pipeline from the United States, which is, of course, not a party to the deals that were involved in setting up this pipeline. But, you know, we've come along to our lords and masters in Washington and we've secured their agreement. And in return, we're going to give Ukraine a one-off payment of $175 million. And perhaps if Ukraine carries out certain reforms, unspecified reforms, we're prepared to give them another $70 million. And, of course, we're also going to open up what might be a fund to help Ukraine develop its green energy future. This is supposed to be up to $1 billion. Anybody who knows Ukraine well knows perfectly well that Ukraine is never going to develop a green energy future. It has no green technology to speak of. It is going to import that green technology from Germany. <laughs> That's where it's going to have to come from. So what you're going to get is the Germans are going to give money to uh, Ukraine. Ukraine's going to have to spend that money on, in Germany. But of course, Germany is going to insist that when it spends that, when Ukraine comes along and buys the various technologies and equipments from Germany and perhaps the Netherlands and one or two other EU countries, of course, it's not going to pay the same amounts that the Europeans pay, it's going to pay three times, five times more, because that's the nature of this. And there will be all the usual middlemen and, uh, you know, uh, facilitators and all of those people. It's another slush fund. <laughs> that's what this is all about. Setting up another EU slush fund, which is another perfect mechanism for getting even more money out in the end from Ukraine. Because to be clear, 
You put in $175 million into Ukraine, but you're going to get an awful lot more money as a result of all this out. Because, as I said, since it's all contingent on reforms, those reforms are going to cost money, and that money is going to have to be spent... Uh, those reforms are going to cost money. That money is going to be spent on consultancy fees and experts and all those sort of people going. So this is a, exactly that kind of, of package. And in the meantime, what do you also do? You are going to interfere. You're going to meddle in the commercial relationship between two other countries. You're going to start meddling in the commercial relationships between Russia and Ukraine. And you're going to say to Russia, well, you know, Russia, you must continue to supply gas to Europe via Ukraine in some level right up to 2034. You must enter. In fact, the agreement is a little less strong about that. Uh, Germany commits itself to using all its leverage to get the Russians to enter into a gas extension transit agreement with Ukraine up to 2034. And you're going to try and force the Russians to send their gas via Ukraine, even if that might not be what the Russians want to do. And it might not make economic or commercial sense to the Russians for the Russians to do that. So Merkel then telephoned Putin and told him about this. And Putin and, you know, one takes this from the Russian presidential website. The readout there, it says that, you know, Putin noted what Merkel said. But it very pointedly, the readout very pointedly makes the point that the deal between Ukraine and Russia for the transit of gas is not a deal between Russia as a state and Ukraine as a, get, as a state. It is between the Russian National Gas Company, which is Gazprom, and the Ukrainian National Gas Company, NAFTA Gas. In other words, it is a deal between companies, not states. And as far as the Russians are concerned, the Europeans have no business meddling in it. So that's it. That's the nature of it. A completely preposterous, ludicrous agreement, exactly as you said, one which creates a vehicle for further plunder and corruption in Ukraine itself, mainly benefiting Germans in this case, and a demand on uh, Russia, which is in insulting, and which the Russians are treating as such, and which is on its face absurd. Okay, let's begin. How pathetic does this look for Germany? Oh, the fact that they have to run, get permission from the U.S. How pathetic does this look? Well, absolutely. I mean, it is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, uh, uh, again, it, it shows uh, this extraordinary weakness that the Germans feel in dealing with in dealing with the United States. But can I just say something? I mean, I don't think Germany is actually in a weak position with respect to the United States. But you have a Chancellor, Angela Merkel, who is always anxious to maintain good relations with the Americans. And I think particularly for her, the concern now is to secure her position uh, uh, with the Americans in order to preserve the prospect of her getting the nice job in the international institution that she needs American support in order to get. Uh, and let's never forget that's a very, very important factor now. I mean, Merkel is looking to secure her future and her retirement. She's going to make an awful lot of money by becoming Secretary General of the, you know, I don't know, the IMF, the World Bank, whatever, UNICEF, something, some big institution. Uh, that's going to be, that's a pension fund that's coming. And she needs the Americans to agree. And that's partly what this is all about. I'm sorry that sounds cynical, but I have no doubt it's the case. No, absolutely. It's, it's just, uh, it's incredible to see Germany get permission from the U.S. But uh, let's start with the U.S. Uh, the Biden, Biden, Ukraine. And I don't mean Biden, the actual person, because Biden, the president, may not even know what the hell's going on at this point. But the Biden machinery, once again, a slush fund in Ukraine. How does that look? Not that the mainstream media will report on this, but how does that look? Oh, it's terrible. I mean, again, what we see is the United States going on and on and on about, you know, fighting corruption in Ukraine and setting up a mechanism to increase corruption in Ukraine. And that's what's going to happen. I mean, that is the nature of this fund. 
it's not uh, anybody who seriously imagines that you know this is a real fund about setting setting up green energy technologies in uh, 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 Ukraine just doesn't know Ukraine. I mean that is a utopian fantasy on its face. I don't believe that the Americans and the Germans who've negotiated this are that ignorant of the situation in Ukraine. Of course they're not. They know perfectly well what they're doing, and they know perfectly well that this is just a mechanism for inclus increasing corruption. It's one of the great paradoxes. The EU has been talking about fighting corruption in Ukraine for as long as I can remember. The entire point of the association agreement, or at least the entire justification of the association agreement that uh, was uh, negotiated between the EU and Ukraine in 2013, and which caused the political crisis there, which has never been resolved, that was partly justified on the basis of ending corruption in Ukraine. The more EU helps to end corruption in Ukraine, I'm talking ironically now, the more corruption increases and the more outsiders benefit and participate in that corruption. That's the reality. As we often say, actions speak louder than words and money talks more loudly than both. All you have to do is follow the money and you understand who and what is responsible for the corruption in Ukraine. All right, let's stay with Ukraine. Uh, 170 million, maybe if everything works out, another 70 billion bonus, 240 million to Ukraine, along with all this green energy uh, nonsense. And uh, I'm sure everything will get, uh, you know, overcharged, overpriced and over budget and it'll end up being a half a million, which will which will not go to the people of Ukraine, nor does half a million really do something to better the economic lives of uh, average Ukrainians. This money is going to be divvied up and shared among the elite. Have you ever seen a country get, you know what, as much as much as Ukraine on an economic level? I mean, this no, is, this is no. a serious question. I say it kind of jokingly, but it is a serious question. It's getting to the point of sad and no. ridiculous how they're using Ukraine as, as this slush fund. Absolutely it is. That's what I have to say. I mean, that $175 million is supposed to be the seed money for a $1 billion fund. Now, where is that money for that $1 billion fund going to come from? It's not going to come from the West, because they say that this is going to be private donors will be putting in the money to this fund. Those private donors are going to be the Ukrainians. <laughs> that's what that's supposed to do. So already you can see where this is coming to. I mean, that, that $1 billion fund is going to... It, 170, you put $175 million in and you take at least, at least $1 billion out. $1 billion out. And that's on top of the fact that Ukraine loses its transit fees, or at least parts part of them. I mean, the country is being squeezed like a lemon. <laughs> and, of course, all the propaganda tells you, pretends the opposite. But that is the reality. Ukraine used to be one of the richest regions of the Soviet Union. It's now the poorest country in Europe. It's getting poorer all the time. I mean, it may not be down to quite African levels, as some people have said, but it's heading downwards. And the, the extraordinary thing is that um, this gets so little mention or admission anywhere in the West. Even, even I've noticed, independent media hasn't woken up to the scale of it. Yeah, I really hate what they're doing to Ukraine and to the people of Ukraine. I mean, I really, Absolutely. really hate it. It's despicable. Uh, finally, Russia, to close it out. Um, you, you mentioned that this is a deal between two companies, as Putin, as the Kremlin website read out. But to be honest, if the Kremlin did want to, uh, to tell Gazprom, look, this is what you're going to do, Gazprom will do it. And likewise with Naftogaz gas as well in Ukraine, if, if the government... The United States, even not even the Ukraine government anymore, the forces that be told to have to gas, you guys are going to agree to this deal. They're going to agree. I mean, the governments, if they wanted to lean on these companies to do it, to do this deal, they would do it. So my question becomes, if they do do it and they extend this 10 years out, 15 years out, these transit fees, this, this bogus agreement, um, 
What does it say about Putin and Russia? Does it say that Putin and Russia are playing ball with these guys? And do they look weak? Do they look like they're also being uh, paid off by you know, the United so States, Merkel, and this and this whole structure? I mean, if they actually agree to this, doesn't this look? Doesn't that look bad? Well, it does look bad, and some people in Russia will be very angry. And bear in mind, there's a lot of criticism of Putin in Russia that he's been extraordinarily weak as many Russians think, over Ukraine and has appeased Ukraine far too much and has appeased the Europeans far too much. I'm going to say something. I think that had everything been left alone, it's quite likely that the Russians would have agreed to extend transit for a while in Ukraine. They've always said they've no intention of simply switching off transit via Ukraine in 2024, that they would be actually looking for to negotiate a new transit agreement. Perhaps not for 10 years, five years would have been a more realistic time frame. And that's, I think, what they were working towards. But, you know, at the moment, Nord Stream 2 cannot carry, can't replace all the gas that Russia exports through the Ukrainian pipelines. So, you know, let's keep some of that gas flowing. That was the Russian position. I think this deal, this, this announcement... By, Mer by Merkel and uh, uh, Washington, Biden, the, the US-German agreement, is going to make it more difficult for the Russians to actually agree a new transit agreement with Ukraine. Because it's been done in a way that if they do agree to it, and as I say, probably that's what they'd intended, that will look like a victory for the US. And I think at this moment in time, I think they're very reluctant to, to concede those sort of victories to the US, or at least paper victories to the US. And I think that if you go to that readout in the Kremlin, as I said, they do make this very stiff point that it's a deal between two companies. They will have read this agreement very carefully, and they will have noted that the Germans and Merkel have not said that if there is no transit agreement between Ukraine and uh, Russia, between Gazprom and NAFTA gas, they will stop accepting gas via Nord Stream 2 or Nord Stream 1 or any, pipe or any other pipeline. They've not even said that they would impose sanctions if, in that sort of case. Um, they said they would impose sanctions in the event that there was aggression against Ukraine, but is a refusal to extend a transit agreement the same as sanctions? I don't know. So the Russians would look at that. But there's a further point to make, which is I think that the Russians are getting very exhausted and fed up with the EU entirely. And there's been a very, very interesting document that was recently published in Russia, and signed off by Putin, which was Russia's um, new national security doctrine, I mean, the, which is supposed to set out the general parameters of Russian foreign policy. And it's fascinating how it makes absolutely clear that as far as Russia is concerned, the EU is a lost cause. It doesn't, the document doesn't even mention the EU anymore. And it's just assumed that the European states are incorrigibly hostile towards Russia. So given that that is the view, the assessment the Russians are making, then who knows? It may be that this agreement, this announcement from Germany from, and, uh, uh, and the US, from Washington and Berlin, will turn the Russians against any extension agreement. But we will see. Yeah. I agree. It's the, the optics will look really bad if they do yeah, an agreement now. Yeah, yeah. There'll now, be a lot. Just if Putin has the political capital to spend on this, because he will lose political capital. He will definitely lose. I mean, can I just say the biggest single ish, issue, if you, if you know about Russia, the biggest single issue about which Putin lost political capital in Russia was over his failure, as many Russians saw it, to stand, to stand strong over Ukraine in 2014. And a lot of Russians were very dismayed about this. Then a couple of years later, there came the pension reform, which of course an awful lot of Russians didn't like either. Now his political position has stabilised since then, but if he were to make a concession on this, 
um, again, a lot of Russians would not be happy. And if you remember, there was a uh, on our most recent live show, there was a caller who spoke about how uh, uh, the mood in Russia amongst ordinary Russians is also hardening and is becoming stronger. And I believe this is true. OK, we will leave it there. Guys, go to the Durant shop, pick up some merch, pick up some shirts, a polo, a hat. Got all kinds of great merchandise. 10% off. Use the code Real News. Check us out on Locals, Super U, Odyssey, Bitch, Shoot, and Rumble as well. Take care.